Hello, everybody, and welcome to the iStep Learning Lab. Today, we're going to talk about the aircraft leasing market before, during, and after the pandemic. And we have Norm Liu with us to talk about that. Now, Norm is the former CEO of GCAS. Uh, at GCAS, uh, Norm was actually the architect of GE's acquisition of GPA in the early 90s, which became the basis for GCAS. And as chief commercial officer and then uh, chief executive officer and then chairman of GCAS, he led the uh, global expansion of GCAS into becoming the world's number one lessor. And after uh, Norm left GCAS a few years back, he has uh, and joined the boards of several different leasing companies. And he is an advisor to ICBC leasing and also to global infrastructure partners. Uh, Norm uh, is a graduate from Yale and he has an MBA from uh, Harvard. And he has also on the personal basis funded uh, scholarships to about 170 students to attend courses in aircraft finance and aircraft technical issues at three universities, two in, in China and one in Hong Kong. And this, these scholarships are managed and, and allocated uh, through the ISTAT Foundation. Before I hand over to Norm, I want to mention that uh, you can make the slides bigger on the screen by clicking in the corner and dragging it out. And you can also post question during our uh, session today. Uh, you can click a little round blue button at the bottom of the screen with two call out bubbles and then write in your questions. And to the extent we have time after Norm's presentation, we will go over those questions with him. I also want to remind you that on October 27th, next Tuesday, we have Rob Morris from Ascend to talk about the uh, aircraft storage. And on November 17th, we have uh, Doug Walker from Seabury talk about airline restructurings. And with that, I want to hand over to Norm Liu. Okay, thanks for that introduction, Niels, and uh, greeting everybody. Um, my uh, pitch is a bit more big picture than the other learning labs, which were uh, functionally focused. Um, I'm not going to have any traffic recovery charts because I don't really know how to do those sorts of slides, uh, but I will talk about uh, the different actions that various lessors are taking um, to cope with this troubled environment. Um, I'd also tr will try to sort of break out of this sort of short-term aviation echo chamber and sort of try to focus on some big factors that may shape the future when we get out to the other side. Uh, now, a distant ancestor of mine <clears throat> 2,500 years ago uh, basically said, "If you study the past if you want to define uh, the future. So I'm not going to go back to the Wright brothers or St. Thomas Dumont or anything, but I'm going to focus sort of at the beginning of the jet age, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I, I say was 1957, which was, of course, the year I was born as well. That was the uh, first year, the 707, four engines took flight. The DC-8 followed uh, thereafter. Back then, um, you know, Jets were for the elite. It was sort of a fine china, white glove uh, affair. All the air, the fares were regulated. Um, um, you know, airlines basically just funded themselves through trust certificates, sort of like the old uh, railroad um, uh, certificates. Um, and it was that sort of uh, world. Now, aircraft leasing, when you look back, sort of had two strands uh, of development. One was sort of tax uh, structured finance types like myself. And then the others were uh, metal uh, aircraft trading type people. Uh, so let me start with uh, the tax side. Back in 1960, 
uh, right after the uh, Republican administration of Eisenhower, tax rates on the personal side were 91% and 52% on the corporate side. So uh, what happened in 1964, uh, John F. Kennedy, who was a Democrat, actually, you know, lowered tax rates to uh, 70 percent on the corporate side and 50 on the individual side. But most importantly, he created uh, uh, incentives for capital investment. So a 7 percent investment tax credit and, uh, and he lowered the depreciation schedule for tax purposes from 20 years to 12 years. Now, the airlines couldn't necessarily utilize those benefits. So sort of the tax leverage leasing uh, was sort of uh, uh, created in in sort of in the mid 1960s. Uh, GE was probably the first corporate uh, investors. They did their uh, first deal in 1967. It was a DC-9 for Allegheny Airlines. And it's sort of interesting that they didn't make the first commercial jet engine to 1971. So Actually, GE got into aircraft leasing sort of uh, uh, as a tax matter as opposed to uh, 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 supporting engines. Now, in 1981, later on, uh, President Ronald Reagan uh, lowered tax rates uh, further from 70 to 50 uh, percent on the uh, personal side and only a little bit on the corporate side from 50 to 46 uh, but most importantly, uh, the investment tax credit was 10% at the time. Uh, he also lowered the depreciation schedule to five years uh, from, uh, from 12 years. So in that period of the early 1980s, basically all many of the U.S. corporations were in uh, tax uh, leverage lease financings of aircraft and other capital equipment. So IBM, Philip Morris, Ford, many, many players were doing that. Um, now, you know, I keep on mentioning the individual tax rate side and uh, what happened there was uh, it was 50 percent uh, during the 80s. But the California state tax rate was 11 percent. California's always led the nation in terms of high uh, tax rates here in the U.S. So what happened is in the 1970s, uh, uh, you know, uh, individuals were getting into leasing all sorts of uh, I equipment like computers and rail cars and things like that, and and eventually aircraft. So uh, two firms were started back then, Polaris, which focused on aircraft in 1973, and then uh, Bab Babcock and Brown in 77. Uh, Incidentally, both founders were, you know, uh, uh, trained at Harvard Law School and they were tax uh, a, a attorney. So they started doing tax shelter deals. Uh, this was Polaris uh, uh, during the, you know, during the late 70s. Uh, uh, Babcock and Brown was more a ranger of, of, of leverage lease, leasing for, for fee income. But then what happened in uh, 1986, Reagan actually lowered the tax rates even more. Uh, uh, the, the, the personal rate went from 50 percent down to 28 percent. The uh, corporate rate went from 46 down to 36 uh, percent. So what happened is all of a sudden, you know, the tax leasing business uh, 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 was dampened uh, quite a bit and uh, different players reacted different ways. So Polaris, which was the uh, uh, aircraft uh, sort of tax shelter specialist, set up. Uh, uh, income funds. Uh, back in 1981, Reagan invested, uh, uh, set up the investment retirement account. So these funds were fund, many of them were funded by IRA accounts uh, in the U.S. And meanwhile, Babcock and Brown, this is the period when they went overseas to Japan and Australia. The Japanese leverage lease uh, uh, started in 1986. And one of the good things uh, through the 70s was, was that inflation rates were very, very high, like 10%. Uh, versus like negative inflation now. And so some of the early deals, uh, I remember looking at some of the pricing files at GE, they priced in zero residuals in the, uh, uh, you know, 19, uh, 1970, let's say. And 15 years later, I mean, the, the aircraft was worth basically 100%. So they were wonderful uh, deals back then. 
Now that's the tax uh, uh, sort of uh, development and it was mainly sort of New York, San Fran and starting off in Asia. Uh, meanwhile, uh, on the metal side, um, actually the grandfather of the, uh, the industry was a fellow named George uh, Batchelor. He would have been a hundred this year uh, 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 if he was still living. Uh, interesting character, heard a lot of stories about him, never had the honor of meeting the fellow, but he was a World War II uh, pilot. And when he came back after the war, he was brokering sort of DC-3, DC-4 military transports in the commercial market, had his own airline called Aero Air. So he, he was, you know, back in the 1950s, this guy was trading planes and uh, he found that he found the airline business because it was so regulated to be very hard uh, 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 to, to play. And so what he did was he moved to Florida in, uh, uh, in the 1960s and formed uh, International Aircraft Leasing in 1964, which I, is probably, you know, uh, the first uh, aircraft leasing specialist in, uh, 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 around. And I think that's why a lot of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Miami cluster of aviation developed, you know, focused on used planes. Uh, uh, you know, it was a hub for Latin America at the time, so parts and things like that. And then also, uh, cargo. Uh, uh, Mr. Bachelor uh, formed, re re reconstituted Aero Air as a cargo plane. And, uh, you know, he, he had a great uh, philanthropic spirit, too. I mean, he's, he's gave away a lot of his fortune to all sorts of good causes in Miami. So he was the grandfather. You, you also had the two fathers of the uh, industry. Uh, Steve Hazy founded ILFC along with the Gonda brothers in 1973. Uh, Dr. Ryan uh, founded uh, GPA uh, a couple years uh, later, and just they 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 then got more into the new aircraft late, uh, business uh, later on. So just really uh, great entrepreneurs on the metal side. Now uh, the corporate stiffs, on the other hand, we sort of after the tax laws changed and and you know rates were lowered and you, you had less of a tax leasing game. We started to converge on the um, operating lease side. So G GE actually bought Polaris. That was a retail syndicator, but it did operating leases. It bought Polaris in 1986 and uh, having had a stake in GPA uh, in 1982. Um, also in Australia, AWAS was formed uh, between TNT and News Corp. Uh, so some corporate money. A uh, bullion who was an ex uh, uh, Tex Bullion was an ex uh, Boeing executive for bullion and uh, I think 86 was the year that uh, Nomura, Babcock and Brown uh, formed the focus on on the Japanese leasing uh, market and then there was a, a shop uh, uh, Peter Nevitt who's a Bank America fellow uh, formed a venture with Mitsui uh, so the trading companies got in so uh, so there were all sorts of green shoots happening on two strands on on uh, tax leasing, going into op leasing and then op leasing. Uh, now, two really exciting developments also occurred, occurred during this uh, period on the on the airline regulatory side. Uh, Ted Kennedy, who was John's uh, younger brother and Alfred Kahn. And during the Carter administration, they deregulated uh, uh, the airline industry um, and they started you know forming all sorts of bilateral treaties all over the the world and remember this was the period of Ronald Reagan and private market free market type reform all over uh, the world so you know you started moving away from the old IATA model where they had conferences on how to fix prices and things like that to more of a free market model so Southwest uh, Mr. Kelleher joined and uh, he became CEO in 81. Uh, so they're like the, 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 you know, the, 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 the pioneer in the low cost industry. They did the, um, 737-300 launch in 84. Uh, BA on the other side of the pond went private. Remember, uh, Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister. That was in 87. Lee Kuan Yew had formed Singapore Airlines in 1972 after they, uh, Singapore broke away from Malaysia. Uh, Emirates, yeah, you know, they were a little bit of modeling after Singapore fo was formed uh, in in 85 by Sheikh uh, Mohammed, 
both Singapore and Emirates basically said, you're, you're, you know, this has to be a freestanding uh, uh, um, um, airline supported by the marketplace. Uh, Deng Xiaoping in China, in, in I think it was about 88, broke up the CAC uh, uh, airline into a whole bunch, uh, in, into three or four uh, airlines. And also, you know, in, 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 in uh, on the Eastern Europe and Russia, the Iron Curtain fell in 89. So Air Flot, all the Eastern European carriers were flying, flying Russian kit. They sort of, they started opening up, up a bit. So very, very exciting period during the airline side. And also the, the OEMs, uh, uh, you know, Douglas was sort of the king uh, uh, starting off. They, they after the 707 and DC-8, they, they came out with uh, the DC-9 in uh, 1965, which is two engine. And Boeing had this 727 thing that came out a little bit earlier, but that was three engines. But then Boeing came back and really started dominating with the 737, uh, the 200s in, in 1967. Airbus, as you know, was founded during this period and the 320s launched in the in the mid 80s. So, so you had a lot of, it's great, these were all narrow bodies that uh, had more installed base, or, so good for operating leasing. On the wide body side, you know, the, the uh, Boeing 747 uh, came out in 1970, really pioneered uh, intercontinental. Uh, um, um, transport. Uh, the DC-10, uh, which was the Douglas product, was a three-engine plane that came out in 1970 as well, but Boeing over, overtook that with the two-engine 767, and then uh, the 757, which is sort of an in-between plane in the early early uh, 80s. So what you had at the end of uh, uh, this period, uh, uh, let's say around 1990, was you had clusters of leasing activity in New York, California, Ireland, parts of Asia, you had uh, airlines uh, deregulating uh, uh, and, and, you know, ready to grow. And then you had the OEMs come out with all sorts of very, very good uh, products. This was definitely the time to get into uh, uh, operating leasing. If you had I was looking at the numbers. If you had bought into ILC's IPO in 1983, uh, if you put in a million dollars and then you rode out, uh, they later sold to AIG and you, you sold out at the peak uh, of AIG's stock price, you would have made a uh, uh, hundred times your money. So a hundred million dollars for one million dollars. So not bad. Now, I actually looked at, you know, if you invested that same million dollars in Microsoft and Apple, you would have made two billion. But you know, n none of us lucked out at any of this stuff. But, but anyway, um, the next uh, uh, period of 1990 to 2010, I call this the uh, golden era. The, um, you know, ILCs and GPAs, the, the large leasing companies started making big uh, spec orders. Um, you know, back then it was sort of this quaint notion that we could be a distributor for OEMs, you know, going into the Iron Curtain countries and things like that. And uh, uh, versus, you know, there wasn't like OEM salesmen at, at every airline as there is today. So it's a, a bit of a distributor model. It's a great time to basically buy wholesale, lease retail, and then sell to investors retail. Um, so what you also found here was, uh, some of the deep pockets uh, came came in. So uh, ILC, knowing they, they had an order, they they sold to very timely uh, right during Gulf War. One, they sold to AIG in 1990, and it was stock for stock. Uh, GPA tried to go public, but uh, sort of missed the IPO window because of the Gulf War. And so GE uh, took over select assets of uh, GPA, bought the uh, organization. Uh, and then uh, basically serviced out the, the, the remainder of the fleet. Uh, we, bought, we bought roughly a quarter of the, the fleet. You also had, during this uh, period, new platforms uh, forming. So Bullion teamed up with Singapore Airlines to form uh, SAIL uh, at, at the time, which is like now the, the core of uh, Bank of China. Uh, Daimler uh, had this thing called Debus Financial Services. They bought the other side. Uh, of, of GPA that was uh, left. I mean, we GE had an equity stake in it, but uh, Patrick Blaney uh, really drove uh, 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 
that uh, entity because he took a, a, a stub company and he bought Indigo, the leasing company, uh, way back then, and you know then was able to sell the um, um, uh, platform to uh, Debus, uh, who wanted some scale. Uh, this is the period where uh, Dono Slattery uh, uh, sold his uh, uh, shop to uh, RBS, and so you had Deep Pockets buying existing platforms and also uh, other pockets, you know, setting up their own. This was also a period where you had many of uh, uh, the niche uh, specialists, uh, a startup, uh, Martin Mueller with Nordic in 1990, the Miami folks in, in, in the early 80s, Apollo and GA Telesis started up, um, in, I'm sorry, in, in, in the sort of O2 timeframe, you had this uh, engine specialist, uh, ELC and Willis, they, they, they uh, well, Willis went public in this area. He, he actually started a little bit earlier, but uh, they, they were they, they sort of grew during this period. And then GCAS, for its own part, uh, bought a little engine platform called Curtis. Uh, we bought um, the shop that Niels used to run called PK and then a part out company called Memphis. It, it's interesting in that we also uh, 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 had some uh, old Pan Am 747. So we we did a wet lease venture. Uh, that we called Polar Air Cargo. That's now part of uh, Atlas. So we we uh, we've been in, uh, GCAS has been in cargo a long time. And just one other uh, historical benchmark is uh, Alps ninety two. Uh, it was set up by uh, GPA. GCAS um, managed it. Uh, of all people, it was Whirlpool, the dishwashing guys. They were the uh, equity at the time. So uh, <clears throat> that's that is sort of the great grandfather of all these ABSs that that was the first that, that the GPA folks had uh, developed now on the air. So, so this, this, the, the, the Opelis market was really starting to ramp up. Uh, meanwhile, the airline side was doing the same. Uh, it was simpatico. Um, you uh, had many people who looked at Southwest success and said, Hey, we, we can do that. Or, or, or looked at uh, Singapore and Emirates. And so, some of these super connectors. And so you have, uh, I, I won't go through all the names here, but you had sort of had two waves. You know, you had the Ryanair, the EasyJet, that, that crowd, AirAsia, uh, JetBlue, that, that was sort of in the 1990s. That was one wave. And then you had a second wave uh, uh, in the 2000s, uh, Wiz, Lion, they, they, you've got to be careful of the term second wave these days, but anyway, they, you had a second round of startups uh, of LCC. So very, very uh, exciting time, wonderful entrepreneurs uh, who built these things from startups to, you know, big successes uh, uh, today. And you also had, in addition, you had uh, uh, investors like Bill Franke, ex-America West, uh, you know, he converted airlines like Spirit and Frontier to the ULCC model. Uh, uh, Tony Ryan's son, Deck, Deck Ryan, uh, with with uh, Viva, so many many uh, uh, great startup success stories um, uh, emerged from this period. <clears throat> you also had multiple crises um, that uh, I call it three and a half crises: uh, the Gulf War in '91, uh, the Asia crisis is sort of a half crisis. You had 9/11, Iraq, and SARS. It wasn't just 9/11. People forget we also had this Iraq War. We have George W. Bush, and then we had the SARS at, at the back end. Uh, you had the great financial uh, crisis as well. And GE all throughout uh, invested big, big dollars um, during uh, the downturn. After 9-11, we invested over $10 billion. Uh, we were, I mean, I was fortunate that my whole period um, with GE, we were triple A, or at the end, we fell the double A. And so uh, uh, just, you know, we, we grew in leaps and bounds during the downturns and because you tend to do better <clears throat> deals. Um, I would say the toughest for, for, for me personally was the Gulf War because 50% of our exposure was in the uh, U.S. We had a lot of tax leverage leases, so subordinated type uh, risk. But fortunately, uh, we had a great team. We had a whole bunch of products. We Actually, we grew Niels's PK shop very, very big after we acquired them doing all sorts of loans to to carriers. And then we had the growth of the emerging markets, which really started 
uh, to really shine <clears throat> during this uh, period. And, and, you know, so if you had uh, Air Canada bankruptcy, you, we could do regional jets. We did a rotables loan, a dip loan, plus purchase leaseback. So uh, we were quite, uh, well, they were tough times. Uh, we, we had some advantages as an, organiza as an organization. Now, during this time frame uh, at 9-11, uh, the U.S. government responded with uh, the uh, Air, uh, uh, Air Transport Safe, uh, uh, Stabilization Board uh, after 9-11. They authorized $10 billion, only did uh, a, a billion, um, mainly because GE did so much on the other side. But that actually served as the model for the $25 billion CARES Act loan and the extra 25 billion on the on the on the jobs uh, care act uh, for the airline so that 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 model was employed to good use uh, in current days uh, so a very dynamic period and then on on the OEM side I won't dwell on this much but this is when the NG came out for the classics the 320s were around but this is when the 321 <clears throat> sort of uh, came in and and originally it was sort of oh, just UK charters but that's really obviously taken off Comac started during this period. The Embraer guys started making uh, bigger, bigger jets. The C series. Uh, you know, Boeing uh, actually, you know, took out McDonnell Douglas in '97. Just one other thing I, I thought I'd mention was uh, uh, back then, you know, people were like, uh, re you know, regulating noise. So the Stage One, Stage Two planes were quite noisy. So they came out with these Stage Three. <clears throat> noise regulations to say like look after I think it was 2000 you can't fly these things so you know that that, that there have been noise and environmental mandates in the past so just just a, a reference point for the future so uh, a great period of uh, rapid growth uh, GCAS you know grew 17 times our net income was 70 million to like 1.2 billion at the end of the period, we crossed the billion dollar threshold in 06. So just a great time for, for uh, at least GE and, and many of the other lessors. Now, some firms actually traded multiple times. So uh, Bullion, I think, traded like uh, four times to Sumitomo, Deutsche Bank, West LB, and finally the ACG. AWAS traded the same to Morgan Stanley, Terra Firma, Macquarie, and then, uh, then into DAE. So this this was a great period, and you see the lease leasing content went from about fifteen percent to, I, and, and these are just rough numbers, went to about thirty five percent during this time frame. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, uh, the last ten years, uh, you know, I sort of call it as you know, all good things must come to an end. And <clears throat> from my perspective, you know, GCAS, you know, we, we, we became number one towards the end of the last decade and remained there till 2016. Uh, and then because GE was shrinking more for corporate reasons, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we had to shrink and sell a lot. Um, um, now, meanwhile, uh, the other lessors were scaling up and some of these talented entrepreneurs uh, really uh you know, had startups that they ramped up very fast. So notably Aircap, uh, they bought this little GE spinoff thing called Genesis in 09, but then they big the they did the big one in uh, ILC in 2013. Uh, you had Adono again uh, at Avalon in, uh, uh, in, in 2010. He started it up, did a great job uh, selling it to Hainan, which had this Hong Kong aviation thing and then bought CIT. So he he, he's really scaled up. And then uh, Mr. Hazi started in, in 2010, just very, very rapidly <clears throat> grew it. And it, it, because it was right after the great financial crisis, it was great timing as well. So you had scale up of major uh, players. Um, they were basically nipping at GCAS's heels, which was a pain from my perspective, but that, that's the way it is. Uh, you, this was also the period where you had really deep pocketed uh, Asian uh, financial institutions come in. So the Chinese, uh, they all came in roughly in 07. And these are not like, I mean, these are like multi-trillion dollar institutions, uh, ICBC, BOC, China Development Bank. Uh, the Japanese came in a little bit later. SMBC took out uh, the RBS platform in 20. 
11 and done a great job uh, <clears throat> growing that. You, you had uh, tax specialists, JP and uh, uh, FPG come out uh, during this time frame, And more recently, as you, as you all know, like uh, uh, Tokyo Century bought uh, ACG and Mizuho uh, bought out uh, air castle and the Koreans also came in more on the investor side here. So this was a time where big, big money uh, was coming in. You also had <clears throat> the sovereign wealth funds and PE uh, players come in, some like GIC as PE players in Avalon, in Nordic, in, uh, in BBAM. Others bought platforms like Dubai Investment Corp. They, they, they had a, a aviation platform that they uh, that they grew uh, uh, organically before uh, buy, buying out um, um, AOS. Uh, Carlisle bought out uh, Apollo, and then KKR did a venture with Altavir. And this was, as we all know, was the recent era where, <clears throat> you know, many, many, uh, there's proliferation of ABSs and, you know, s aircraft trading became a lot more common. Uh, so, uh, you know, is a two-edged sword from my perspective. On the one hand, more competition. Uh, on the other hand, um, it enabled uh, the large players to recycle aircraft for gains and to manage uh, exposure. So I think GE during this time frame <clears throat> probably sold 15 billion plus of assets. That doesn't even include the PK uh, loan platform, which is sold recently. Uh, so. Okay, the good news is booked a lot of <clears throat> gains off of this because, as you remember, interest rates fell during this period. <clears throat> and some of the credits that were emerging credits, um, which we did in the last phase, they really grew. And so you had sort of a credit spread tightening as well, which, have to gain, which, happened, which helped the gain potential as well. So <clears throat> much, you know, uh, now on the airline side, um, what you saw here was, uh, the LCC's high fuel prices put so much pressure on a lot of the network carriers that the logical response was they they merged. So in 2012, 2013, you know, the Northwest Delta, the UAL Continental, the, the U.S. Air American Airlines, all this stuff happened in that time frame. IAG buying Iberia, Aer Lingus, et cetera. LATAM uh, happened in 2012, which is Lon buying TAM. Uh, 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 Lufthansa with Air Berlin and, and um, um, Swiss. Uh, Aeroflot uh, is sort of interesting that um, after the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, you know, all the, the Aeroflot broke up <clears throat> into the baby flots, I, I don't know, a dozen or so. And then, but slowly, but slowly, the, the, they, they all merged back to uh, the mighty Aeroflot that we know uh, today. Now, during this period, uh, some of the charter carriers uh, went out, you know, Thomas Cook, uh, you know, they, they sort of faced the ten pr twin pressures of LCCs and, you know, things like Airbnb. So people could sort of do it yourself in charter world. And because e-commerce became so dominant on the cargo side, some of the general carriers, cargo carriers went out. Uh, this was a period also that because it was such growth, a uh, huge, huge increase in the OEM orders, whether it's from lessors or uh, direct airlines. I remember some air shows during this period. I mean, you know, several thousand units were being sold. I mean, if you weren't ordering 200 planes, you were viewed as a bit of a wimp. Um, and I was, quite frankly. I mean, you know, I, I, I choked going above 100, quite frankly. Uh, you'll recall that Southwest launched the the, the, you know, the NGs were like 70 units. So this was sort of a, a surreal period where I think everyone at the OEMs were sort of pinching themselves that this can't last. So um, inevitably what happened is there's too many lessors. And, you know, I don't know, before the period before there were maybe five lessors running around trying to play slots. This period there were like 15. So rents uh, suffered, lead times uh, suffered and the OEMs were ramping up so much they had, as, as we all recall, sort of like an eon ago, but there were su supply chain issues. Now, the OEMs, they, they continually, if you look through all of these periods, they, 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 they came up with greater products. The Neo and then the Max, the 220 out of the C-Series, uh, the 350 in response to the 787, 
the uh, uh, and, and, and then the 330 and Neo and 777 uh, X's and the Chinese actually, you know, had the in-flight of the ARJ-21. So, <clears throat> you know, this was a period where the industry uh, matured, uh, probably over matured in that there was sort of oversaturated supply of metal. And, but, and at the same time, the customers, there was customer consolidation. So, uh, Pre COVID, the least percentage was probably 45% in, in that range. Um, so, uh, that's what we were sort of facing, uh, going into 2020. We, we were, you know, an industry that was sort of already sliding a bit, um, but then sort of slipped off the cliff, uh, with, with COVID. And so I'll start with a quote, uh, <clears throat> again, JFK actually used this uh, uh, in 1959. He said, crisis in Chinese has two characters, uh, danger and opportunity. And I've seen this like consulting, you know, everyone uses this thing here in the West, but actually uh, that's the wrong translation because uh, it, it's way she, it, it's danger for sure is the first character. Uh, but G is not like opportunity. It's more like, an exclamation mark, like, holy shit, danger, right? So uh, so maybe the Chinese version of crisis is the right one <laughs> to describe our present environment. Like, I'll go through this page quick. I mean, you know, demand's been crushed by the shutdowns, travel restrictions, fear of flying. We all know that short haul will recover faster than long haul, probably bit, uh, uh, leisure before business. Cargo's been... A bright spot, especially if you have dedicated cargo, it's obviously not a panacea if you're just cover, uh, carrying stuff on the packs, <clears throat> on, uh, in packs, uh, uh, packs planes. Um, so the demand's been crushed. Uh, the recovery, we, you know, like we all know, wh whether it's vaccines, testing, travel bubbles, uh, the efficacy. I mean, you know, I, let, let's just say if you're running at 40% of 2019, maybe next year, knock on wood, will be 60%, uh, which means if you want to get back to sort of 2019 and 23 to 25, you need compounded growth of between 15 and 30%, uh, which, you know, is going to be easier said uh, than done. I, you know, I think, you know, vaccinating 8 billion people on the planet uh, is going to be a very protracted chore, probably underestimated. Um, 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 you know, I think people probably underestimate the resolve of the Asian countries to uh, uh, open up. Uh, I, uh, my wife is from Korea, and in Korea, you still have 14-day quarantines for you know foreigners and Korean Korean citizens. Uh, you, it's not self-quarantining like in the what? It, it's in a hotel. It's monitored. Uh, you got to stay in your room. Okay, you might have a balcony for some fresh air, but literally, uh, they also, I, I didn't know about this, but they actually, you know, if you order like a pizza or something, you got to keep your garbage in your room for 14 days. So they, they, I think we underestimate the risk tolerance uh, of some of the countries for, for, for this virus. So that's that's the demand side, hopefully recover. As you know, I, I don't need to belabor this. There's just tons of excess supply everywhere from the airlines to the lessors to, you know, I don't know, 500 plus tails on, on the OEM tarmac. Now, fortunately, uh, <clears throat> the, there've been big dollars uh, from the governments to uh, support the airlines. Really, they're really wanting to support the jobs and maintain the infrastructure in many cases. Uh, the Fed policy, the fiscal stimulus policy. Hopefully, we'll get another one today uh, out, out of Washington. That's been fantastic. You know, the Fed policy really helped the capital markets uh, uh, issue uh, a lot of bonds. So, um, um, you know, airlines have been able to, with Greg Lee, Lee's uh, competent help and some of the I bankers who also do bank credit cards for the aviation business, they've done a great job uh, leveraging the kitchen sink, loyalty programs, uh, everything. And so that, uh, thanks to the cap markets being vibrant. And I have to admit, you know, having the 
uh, ATSB template from the goal, uh, from uh, from 9/11 <clears throat> was great because all they did was they marked it up. They they sort of changed the numbers from 10 to 25 billion, and they got the jobs program to get another 25 billion, which is what they're talking about adding a, yet another 25 billion. And I think it was a great effort by uh, the airlines, uh, the ATA. And and the flight uh, the flight attendants un unions especially everyone was working hand, hand 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 to hand on this to get the to get the money and so I I I I, I hope like anything um, um, you know Pelosi and Mnuchin can agree to something because otherwise it's just, it would be tragic um, and, and so if they can get this at least they get a lifeline till first quarter <clears throat> now. I, I think when you look at all this, I, I, I sort of look at the airlines and, and I call it a triage for want of a better word and, and three buckets. Uh, there's the 20 percent. I, I, these are just round numbers of carriers where they're, you know, well funded, well run, low cost carriers. <clears throat> they, they're or they're flag carriers that had, uh, you know, substantial liquidity or government help. Or in the case of Alitalia, they actually got nationalized. Uh, that's one bucket. Then the other side is, I, I'll go to the other side, are the candidates where, unfortunately, they're probably liquidations at the end of the day. Um, um, you know, it, it's just too tough of an, an environment. And then there's the great in-between gray area <clears throat> where they're, they're either deep restructures, like they've done a Chapter 11 or maybe a 26A or, you know, a, a scheme of arrangement. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's one. And then there are others where just like, Hey, we, we, we're just, uh, I, I know people, I call them, they're in a sort of a coma state. I know some people call it hibernation, but hibernation assumes you'll wake up. Right. And then other people have called them zombies, but I don't like that term either because in the movies, right. We want, we want to like make those guys go away. And, and so anyway, I, I call it, there are a lot of airlines in the coma state and I just hope they, they will awaken for all, for all of, all of our benefits. So, that's where that's where the airlines are at. We all know the OEMs with what's going on there, production rates, you know, deferring slots, cost cuts. But meanwhile, trying to su sustain the <clears throat> so supply chain, so unparalleled issues there. And the lessors, I mean, we we're we're not immune. So I would say um, seventy percent. You know, they have strong costs of funds, very strong par parent. You know, I mentioned all the Asian banks. Uh, twenty percent are like they have strong liquidity, <clears throat> but they rely on wholesale funding, uh, and their cost of funds have gone up. Uh, price to book is is struggling a bit, um, and then, but they'll make it through. And then there's the ten percent that you know, the the the, the 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 they're they're really struggling. So you know, if if you just look at the cost of funds, some can borrow at two hundred, some are three hundred to four hundred. Hopefully they can get lower, and then then there are those who are like the secondary papers trading at six hundred. So what 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 you have in uh, sort of today is we we've got severe ex I mean really severe excess capacity, and whether it's twenty three the twenty five time frame. I know some people say twenty two, some people say twenty eight. So you know just pick a number twenty four, <clears throat> which seems like an eternity away. You have you've had great government support, but I think that's petering out. I mean, governments have so many other demands on their funds uh, right now, restaurants, hotels, what have you. Uh, um, so, you know, the industry's best off focusing on bubbles and testing and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, you have a situation where given the demand shock, basically the lessors are serving as the shock absorber for the demand. I think most will, as I said, will will muddle through. Uh, you've already lost, I, I don't know what the last count was, say 40 airlines. Now, not all of them, I think it's very important to say <clears throat> of the 40, not all of them are going to liquidate, right? It's really, restructurings are bad, but liquidations are really bad. But so I don't know how many of the lists, maybe 10 will not liquidate, right? Some of the bigger names. Uh, and then we've got, we all, you know, coming into the winter have the second wave. Uh, well, some would say third wave <clears throat> on the virus, um, but um, there's also a restructuring second wave. So, you know, the initial sort of, you know, romantic theory of three-month deferral, six-month, 12-month payback with interest, 
that's probably gone out the window for most. And so now you're either looking at, you know, step rent, you know, maybe you get the overdues and shortfalls paid out over the lease term. <clears throat> so you you're, you at least get okay accrual rents, even though the cash isn't coming in. Uh, and then you, you know, you have now also, you know, power by the hours, uh, quite, quite common. It's not because, I mean, it's mainly because who knows when the, where the passengers will be, you know, mark to market your contract rent, return condition erosion. So this is the world we uh, live in, in, in the present environment. Now, <clears throat> uh, rather than just sort of dwell on this too much, I'll, I'll just sort of, you know, say, look, I mean, I, I know uh, the different firms I work, I mean, everyone is working really, really hard and I applaud your efforts. And it's really amazing that everyone's doing this from home. Okay, uh, using, you know, uh, off their websites, using DocuSign, whatever the latest technology. So it's really, I mean, it's hard enough, but to realize that, you know, we're doing it from home, it's really, it's really quite amazing. Pretty much everyone is focused on defense, right? Um, that, that's already got a fleet. And so they've, you know, canceled, pushed out uh, order streams, you know, limit the CapEx. Everyone's working on collections, restructuring, <clears throat> you know, getting records uh, in case there's a redelivery. And, you know, in fairness, I, I, you also sit there going, how can you, you know, some of these countries you can't fly out uh, or how do you get people in without quarantine? So the whole redelivery repo process is a little bit uh, trickier. You know, will there be equity coming in? from shareholders or other sources, you know, or do the lessors have to do a bit of that? That wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Um, and you, you know, like I said, you've got the second shoe, you know, you might've signed up a stipulation and, you know, well, let's talk about it later. Well, that's starting to now be later. And so uh, some of the people will say, I don't need a hundred planes. I only need, even though I rejected 20 already, I only need 50. <clears throat> so can you compete? I, I'll, you know, I'll do, sort of a duck auction. So these sorts of things are happening and you just have to play, play through. I mean, you, you know, you, you want to limit repos because there's a lot, not a lot of prospects elsewhere, but, and so if there's no franchise, if the behavior is not good or, you know, you're worried about cannibalization, yeah, you have to place the planes with desert airways, right? But hopefully that's the minority of operate. I think most people are working in the spirit of uh, partnership and when you have to remarket AOGs or roll off, you know, I, I think the industry has a thousand plus planes rolling off. There's very limited uh, prospects. There are a few startups in Australia and Brazil and, you know, the U.S., but it's it's pretty slim picking. So you're not just talking about, you're again talking about a power bit, the hour with some fixed rent, perhaps lease. But, you know, in many cases, you're talking storage, maybe part out. In some cases, like the 738, maybe cargo as well. So that's the asset side. Now, on the liability side, you got to, you know, everyone's got to watch their <clears throat> cash uh, uh, and they have to either issue bonds to refi, uh, uh, manage covenants, uh, maturities, that, that, that sort of thing, or, you know, get a whole boatload of availability just in case uh, the capital market shift. <clears throat> um, and, you know, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, as you get their year end audits and all this sort of stuff going on, um, you know, everyone's got to prepare for the prospect of lower appraisals, especially on the wide bodies, I would say. And, you know, what does that mean to, uh, uh, um, you know, your balance sheet and what does that mean for your ratings, you know, especially if you're on the cusp of investment grade. So <clears throat> a lot on the platter for most, uh, uh, less source, maybe less on the liability front for some of the well-funded people. Uh, now, as I said, this is the time, you know, you have to play the cycle and buy a lot, uh, but that's easier said than done. And so that's for a limited few. You, you have to have the funding. You have to have a portfolio. That's okay. You have to have the risk appetite. And, but the issue here, unlike previous downturns where, where G was the big dollars out there, there, there were very few other players. Now you've got <clears throat> sort of for the quality new tech PLBs, you've got uh, uh, Asian players who have better cost of funds. 
the Jalco JOL market is still there, albeit you know for only the tip top tier uh, airlines. And all of that liquidity that was raised from governments and cap markets, well, uh, those the you know that they some of the people don't need the liquidity right now. They need to survive operating uh, uh, first. So um, there are deals, okay, um, but you know there's also competition. There's also, you know, as, as people push back the orders, there are fewer, there's fewer capex uh, to finance, and and one of the issues is like, well, okay, if you have a great credit, okay, you can take an old world price, maybe. Though it doesn't make a lot, I mean, but you should maybe take a revised old world price. But if you have a lesser credit, you know, how can you do an old world price where you know if you get the plane back, <clears throat> like in the next year or two, the rent market is like, you know very, very ugly, you know, 0.5 lease rate factor or something like, like that. So it, it's really hard to get your hands around doing, you know, new tech stuff. And I'm not even talking about, you know, CEOs and NGs that, that, that has its own fair share of problem. So, um, you know, there'll, there'll be deals, but uh, a lot of the good ones are already taken. Uh, there, as I understand, there's not much portfolio trading out there. There are people who are trying, you know, that are <clears throat> sending lists out mainly for discovery purposes. And, you know, uh, that, that'll take a while. May, partly because of price gaps, but also partly because some of those buyers who relied on ABS, they, you know, the ABS market is shut for now. Um, so not a lot of trading. So you, you have to go more to the airline primary <clears throat> side. Uh, now they're they're logically with all the excess should be um, you know opportunities for older kit uh, for used serviceable materials cargo feedstock um, but right now there's a bid and ask as I understand and patience will be required there there are there's always some good bond <clears throat> plays like you know I'm sure March April there were some very nice bond spreads that could be had in the secondary trading market so you know for for certain institutional investors that might be a good Play. But again, you got to be uh, you got to be patient, you know, wait for the next next shoe to drop. Uh, and then and then for some of the public fellows with the, the 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 you know price to book value discounts, I mean, it may be a better allocation to <clears throat> buy back shares at some level versus doing new business. So um, it, it, it's tough because you want to you want to invest during the downturn, assuming you can get the right price and everything. Um, but it's easier said said than done. Um, I, I was very fortunate in my career to have like a triple A balance sheet to take advantage. Okay, so now let's assume you survive. It's now 2024. <clears throat> and, and I tried to, this is a super noisy page, but I tried to list out factors that might impact the other side. And, you know, you just, you just look at the pandemic, all the fires and floods, all the weather calamities that are going on. You look at the U.S. election. I mean, basically, all th these things have accelerated trends that were happening anyway. Uh, and it's also brought issues that we all know about to the fore. So I, I've listed like, you know, a few just for, you know, food for thought. I mean, one is we all know about digital transformation, right? Software is going to eat the world and all that. I don't want to dwell on that. Uh, you know, climate change, uh, you know, there's an energy transformation in addition to the digital transformation. And, you know, everyone is jumping on the, uh, you know, net zero by 2050. You know, Biden gets elected, the power gen industry, he's talking net zero by 2035. So we look a little bit out of step in aviation where we're saying, well, can we do 50% by 2050? But at any rate, <clears throat> that, that's really come to 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 the fore in many, many people's minds, and especially the millennials. Uh, nationalism uh, or a breakdown of multilateral stuff, I mean, that's, uh, it, it, it's not an America, China first thing or, or trade dispute. Just look at it. The Everyone's, you know, doing their own national quarantines. Uh, it can't just be the FAA now. Everyone's got to approve stuff. Uh, uh, country by country, supply chain breakup. So that's a third factor. <clears throat> the fourth factor is you have this inequality, diversity thing going on, you know, sort of a haves versus have not thing that's been brought uh, to the fore. 
And, you know, meanwhile, you have these internet giants, you know, raking it in and guys net worth breaking, you know, 200 billion and things like that. <clears throat> so you have that tension. And then you've got the policy, which has been great, right? But you have the other side, which is after all this easy money, well, there's going to be huge deficits and, you know, likely taxes, <clears throat> likely some re-regulation. Uh, and then everyone's got a much more profound respect for black swans or whatever they may be. You know, the type of stuff that you just sort of hide when some risk manager is talking about. And so <clears throat> these are the sorts of things. I think all of these impact our world. Um, now, you've got people who say, uh, the optimists who say, uh, oh, look at the Spanish flu in 1918. Look at the roaring 20s. Maybe it'll be like that, right? Then you've got all these people with agenda who are like, well, oh, everyone's going to work from home. Forget about office buildings. Everyone's going to shop from home. Forget about shopping malls. Uh, cities, they're toast. Everyone's moving to suburbs. Uh, renewals, renewables, that's everything. Forget about fossil. Uh, globalization is dead. So you, you hear this stuff <clears throat> as well, and that's sort of, sort of alarmist the other end. And I think the reality, is, though, is there's a grain of truth to, to all of these. So I, I think, you know, the truth is always somewhere in between. And so uh, when I look at our, our laundry list, I sort of go, okay, let's just look at PAX demand. You know, what, um, um, okay, hopefully when you get to 2024, it's not going to shrink again, right? That, that, that'll that depend on macros and, you know, maybe another uh, pandemic, but you know, but the real question is like, look, to get to 4% by 2030 for the decade, you know, I think you got to be like six and a half percent. That's just math. Okay. And that, that seems to be a chore, even though the last few years were above uh, uh, that, you know, we're, we're sort of at about that level. You know, could it be zero? Could it be two, four? You know, because it's not just the macros, it's, it's you know, uh, the, just take the business traffic. Everyone talks about Zoom. Okay. And, um, you know, in 9-11, the same thing happened. Everyone says, oh, it's going to all be teleconferencing and all that air airline passengers will go, you know, there'll be less business. But <clears throat> the reality is the technology is way the heck better now than uh, uh, back then. You also have 5G. You know, look at all these capital markets raises. They've been all been done virtually. OK, no more. I mean, I used to in the old days when I was a banker, I used to go to the financial printers at night and sit there waiting for the printing presses and all that sort of stuff to print out the prospectus. All that stuff is all virtual. You know, road shows, all that stuff is, is going uh, virtually. Uh, you know, I, I sit on a bunch of boards and like, you know, had 10 plus board meetings. They all went on with a snap. So no need to fly to Dublin or whatever. Uh, and, and, and I know someone at a consulting firm who basically said, because I asked, like, well, how's business? He said, margins are great, and the backlog's held. So I said, well, how can margins be? And he basically says, we mark up T&L, and there's no T&L. So, uh, uh, you know, whatever margin they mark it up, it's dropping to the bottom line. So the seniors see that, and they're going to go, except for customer-facing business, hey, why don't you use, you know, use the real good technology that you have? So I, I think there'll be an impact on – on business and you see some of the network carriers, you know, being pretty, pretty conservative there. <clears throat> on leisure, I think the issue is just like, uh, look, are, are people gonna stay more local or, you know, in the region? Uh, are retirees who wanted to see the world, you know, someone like me, are they gonna like, are they gonna risk everything to go to some exotic vacation on their bucket list? I, I they'll, they'll be, you know, there's adventures and all of us, some people may not do that. They'd rather just go to the old sort of Cape Cod destinations if you're in the U.S. or the, the old haunts. That's that's what's going on. Or, you know, they're happy to, uh, you know, I, 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 I live in Rhode Island at a summer uh, re resort and all it was packed with people and they normally would go to Europe. But all that money is flowing into, you know, the more local um, uh, community. Now, you know, at, if you have less business traffic given the profitabilities well and you still want to make the same profits well fares will have to eventually rise <clears throat> in the in in economy um as well and what does that do to elastic you know with with, with you know the, with demand 
Uh, and then I just I just threw out sort of a wacky thought like VR, right? I, I mean, I have no idea. I'm not into that stuff, but who knows? Maybe someday everyone will be just on, you know, video Oculus screens or something with Facebook. I mean, the, the younger people actually like that sort of stuff. So anyway, that I, I, the man, the real question is, what's the growth rate going to be? <clears throat> Assuming it's growth rate, is it going to be, you know, zero, two, four, six? You know, I don't know. Uh, shrinkage, we all, uh, on the long haul side, we all say, oh, yeah, long haul, that's way off. And, well, you know, airlines make a lot of profits on that stuff. So if they want to make it up elsewhere, what are they going to do, right? It's got to be fair. So <clears throat> if you don't have as much hub feed, okay, uh, for short haul, well, well, well that volume has gone. Um, so you see the situation now where, uh, uh, and I'm just talking the U.S. flight, right? Everyone goes, oh, my God, everyone wants to go to Colorado where there's fresh air. So everyone's putting on flights there. <clears throat> uh, you see some of the uh, 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 Southwest and people going after the, the main carrier hub. So it's sort of a, you know, ho hopefully they call it win the recovery. Hopefully it's not get bl really bloodied in the whole, whole process. So, so I think this is the sort of stuff on the demand side. I, I think on the supply side, you sort of go, oh, um, it'll get better, but – um, you know, are the OEMs just, I mean, they want to ramp rate, you know, uh, okay. Instead of 20 to 40, maybe they want to go back up to <clears throat> 60 to meet the refleet needs. Okay. You, you see the refleet studies and all that stuff. And, and, you know, they'll have the ECAs and the XM and support cause it's a jobs thing. And then I, I guess the real question is what's the pricing going to be, right? You know, uh, they were getting productivity. So escalation was dropping to the bottom line, but <clears throat> now that they've really taken out costs even more, you know, now that, um, you know, I, I don't know, advanced manufacturing, 3D printing and all that stuff go, goes out. What, what's the pricing going to going to be in, 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 in the future? Um, so that that's one thing on the supply side. I think when you look at other factors, the ESG front with a focus on the E, e environmental, you know, um, for us, is it going to move beyond Corsia? And just saying, oh, we've got new new technology fuel, and you know, we all have seen what's happened in France, where where they want to limit, um, you know, they well they want to mandate fuel savings, and they also want to limit um, air traffic when there's a alternative means like rail. So everyone loves rail. You know, rail is going hydrogen right now. That sort of stuff. So you've got it, it's it's real taxes. You know, it, it, real taxes, real mandates going on there. Uh, air traffic management. I know we talked about it the last, you know, decade, but this is a time to get this done, man. Right? The airports aren't that big. You got to work together and get get that stuff done. That that's real things you can point to beyond just buying offsets and tech. Uh, uh, because when you start talking about sustainable fuels, you know, uh, and people are doing that uh, more as PR stunts right now. But I mean, <clears throat> you know, at some point, people may mandate. OK, so if, if they say 30 percent of your fuels have to be, you know, biofuels, OK, which are right now four times the normal. I mean, you, you just doubled your fuel bill and we would go, well, no, but we can't. But but people might say we don't care. You know, it's either a tax or you pick your poison or or, <clears throat> or or, you know, it is don't travel. Then. That's my solution. Right. And so and you hear that from. Uh, a lot of groups. So when Qantas did their flight to nowhere, right, and so you know all the road warriors were into it, but you had this group of people going, "Why are these flying?" And, and SQ didn't do it then, right? So, uh, and you've got uh, I love the uh, Airbus wing. I, I, I love to you know fly that someday if I'm still alive. But you know, and and hydrogen's you know it, it's it's happening in power gen. It's ha happening on on the land <clears throat> transfer. Obviously, there are all sorts of you know. Uh, load, range, center of gravity, infrastructure. There are all sorts of issues when it comes to aviation. But, you know, it's probably a long-term solution to at least short-haul planes. Long-term, longer-haul planes are probably the sustainable fuel stuff. And, you know, I, I think all that comes down to is like, well, what does that mean for cost and fares? And what does that mean for residual value? What if, what if they have a, you know, stage three equivalent on fuel? Okay, what does that mean for NGs and CEOs? So that that's that's uh, environmental uh, regulation, right? We we know already product development, you know, safety, all that stuff is going to be regulated. 
know, I don't know if you, you know, certain markets, not free market, may, may go to a fair capacity management model, sort of like CAAC, <clears throat> uh, because, you, you know, you can't, I've seen this with, it happened in Brazil with Varig and Tam, and, you know, where, where instead of like, you know, letting the airlines kill each other and go out of existence, they basically manage, they have, they call it like code shares and things like that. But basically what happens is fares rise, but, you know, the passengers uh, pay. And so you may see stuff like that. We, I talked about environmental, you know, mandates. Hopefully at the same token, you know, you, you should be going after subsidies big time, okay, uh, for high, you know, whatever, sustainable fuels. I mean, uh, you can be damn sure the wind, you know, solar crowd will be doing that. Uh, this industry should be going for, for this sort of stuff as as well. By the way, I mean, I, as I was researching the Reagan tax cut, the energy tax credits for solar wind actually came out during his period. They were 20 percent. So <laughs> uh, um, anyway, that, that's that's regulation. Uh, deglobalization. I talked about that. China decoupling. Right. Um, you know, what does that mean for, you know, the second biggest aviation market? Are they going to you know, when the COMAC goes into service, which it will mid decade, you know, if, if, if you're, you know, buy, buy your own stuff, it's sort of obvious. So what, what, what then happens to the other um, suppliers? If you, if you just got a ton of government funding, you know, in the EU, are you really going to buy, well, probably not going to buy Chinese, are you going to be really buying the other guy's stuff? And so these sorts of political considerations, I mean, you'd like to say, no, we're going to bid it, but, but these, these are real Things and I, I, the black swan I, I, I just sort of throw out is cyber and military, right? Uh, on page three, there's you know this little sort of China India border spat. God knows, South China seas and all this sort of stuff. And cyber uh, is scary. I mean, it can control all sorts of physical assets. And so, what what happens there? Um, and then there's just your normal boring macro parameters, right? <laughs> like interest rates, you know that probably going to go up, which is sort of good in that some of this alternative money will go away. But on the other hand, the alternative money is coming in right now. So it's not going to go away. It's going to come in and then it's going to go up and everyone's going to get the soup on interest rates. Currency, uh, you know, a lot of people think the dollar is going to devalue a lot, which is good. On the other hand, a lot of people are just going, hey, you know, ours has been a dollar based industry. But in China, I want renminbi. So unless you've got renminbi source of funds. Euro, more Euro leases going on. Inflation generally is sort of good, you know, I, I, at least from the 1970s experience. And then you got your normal micro parameters, right? BEPS, you know, base erosion profit theory, right? Which is taxation, right? Uh, um, you know, are, are they going to uh, just, are you going to be shielded from if you're doing a deal in country A, are they going to, you know, tax you in country A despite being based in Ireland? Uh, this is the sort of stuff I know when I was CEO and the tax people and the account, I would just go, yeah, 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 go away. Right. But uh, this stuff now, now with everyone looking for revenue, this is going to be, this is going to come back to the fore in some. Uh, and then you've got all the airline micro factors, fuel, your normal, right. That's probably going to go up eventually. Uh, labor, which, you know, normally you would go, oh, but there's a ton of labor, but you know, there's also minimum wages creeping up, all sorts of labor, you know, pro labor types of things, airports, right? They, they've been suffering too, right? They, 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 they have half of them. And, you know, are they going to just say, yeah, you're suffering. So um, I'll just charge you. I mean, you know, they, they may, God knows what they're going to do because they, they, they basically, you know, have the real estate. Um, and then MROs on the one hand, there's excess now, but once they start dropping like flies, what, what happens there? So these are the sorts of, I don't have any, this is just sort of the laundry list, not to get paralyzed by, but things to think about. I, I, I think when it comes down to uh, shape of the industry, I sort of go like, well, what well, is the size of the industry and, and its growth rate, given all this stuff? Uh, given the OEM supply, you know, or, or is it, you know, what will the supply, the man balance look like? I mean, you know, all the slots, the lessor slots have been pushed into 23, 25. And well, um, okay, so 21, 22, you, you, you know, you maybe, you know, there's not a lot of demand, but there's got a lot of slots in, in 23, 25, a lot of OEM slots too. And meanwhile, you have a ton of old kit. Okay, the old kit, you, you'll say, oh, but they're not ESG friendly, but 
the pricing is going to be very, very attractive. So you've got this supply demand thing to confront with. And, and ultimately, the airlines that survive, right? Okay, in the short run, they're doing some sale leasebacks. But in the long run, these guys tend to like to, to own or they'll use ECAs or if they buy, they won't take slots from us, but they'll they'll buy from the OEMs, maybe cheaper, and then do, you know, do, do bid out uh, leasebacks. Yeah, maybe they'll take out Maybe they'll gladly do POBs on the NGs and CEOs, but do you really want to do that stuff given given what 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 what's what's going on and given the supply? And even the Neos and Maxes, you know, when, when you look into the 2030s with the next next technology. And for the weaker credits, it's just tough. It, it's it's gotta be a pricing example. <clears throat> so now to the dangerous page where you try to make some <laughs> Prediction. So what I did was I sort of said, let me look to some contemporary leaders, you know, some real deep thinkers for inspiration. And so I came to our presidential candidates, Joe Biden and Trump. And the most notable quote I got was he doesn't have a clue. Uh, I don't think they were referring to me. I think they were talking to each other. We'll see if Thursday they make nice. But that, that was about the most notable thing I could find from all the uh, all, all the stuff going on here. But anyway, um, let, let me just uh, finish up. Um, uh, and, and I don't much time. Uh, you know, look, if, if the industry is slower growth, more concentrated airline, it, there's got to be some sort of shakeout or they're going to be me mediocre margins. Large consolidations, easier said than done. Niche players will probably survive. Asian banks, you know, they're, they're in a strong uh, position. Okay. And they have a lot of product array, but you know, they, they have to, they have uh, organizational issues to contend with. The large wholesale funding guys have sort of, you know, they got to figure out what to do with all these old planes, you know, the, the life cycle, what are you going to do? Who's going to buy this stuff? What's your growth story for the future? You know, your price to book value, your cost of funds will improve. And, and you know, there'll be, so as a business, I'm not sure it's a great business, but, uh, you know, there'll be, but there'll be some trades, right? Uh, better margin POBs, use kit. And so when I, I was sort of, I'll just finish up with this line. I was looking at this sort of with a CNBC talking headset, head headset, and I basically go, you look at our industry, it's sort of a slow recovery mid cap story in, in financial institutions, but everyone likes like Snowflake. It's got a bigger market cap than GE. You look at Zoom, it's got a bigger mar market than Airbus and Boeing. You know, are there other asset class like infirm real estate that got better yield? Should you invest in airlines just if you had stock money? You know, so I, you know, I, 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 I say as a business, it, it could be a little, it, it may not be on the A list, but the good news is we will survive, albeit maybe a little different. So Niels, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Norm. Look, uh, I don't have a whole lot of questions, which I think, I think is because you were quite uh, deep in your analysis. Uh, one thing, though, that uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you, you talked about the airlines that were the ones that would muddle through, that were the ones that would uh, go into bankruptcy and restructure, and that were the ones that would liquidate. And you uh, allocated some percentages to these three buckets. If you look at the leasing companies today, what do you think the allocation is going to be between those three buckets? The ones that muddle through, okay. the ones that have to go bankrupt, and the ones that will liquidate? Well, I, I, I think I meant, I, I, maybe I didn't mention, I, I, I was sort of going like when you look at the top 20, maybe it's 70%, fine, 20%, eh, that'd be fine, and 10%, uh oh. And, and you just look at cost of funds, that's the surest, you know way to look at things and um, I'm not saying they're gonna like they, 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 it's not like they're gonna disappear but they may restructure things like that so you mentioned that uh, you know up to now we had about 45 percent of the world's aircraft were leased aircraft if you look at the 25 to 30 time span would you expect that proportion to increase or, or decrease um, I think it could increase to maybe 50% or something like that, but mainly because people want to recycle the old, you know, the, the, the older stuff or it's a financing thing. Um, um, but, you know, I'm not sure. I, I know we pride ourselves on that, but I sort of go like, oh my 
God, I wish, you know, I wish I were number 50 in this market or, uh, you know, I wish we only had 10%. <laughs> but so I think there'll be more because of, of, of financing need or recycling old technology at the margin. But um, the question is whether investors, you know, want to do that without, you know, proper pricing. Uh, Kibe Huang asked the question, did you accept seven and eight and 20? These are platforms that have been around a long time. Uh, Sorry, Kibe Huang asked if you think that there's going to be some consolidation among the source in the wake of this uh, crisis. Uh, well, logically there should, but when you look at it from a lessor, you know, uh, uh, and I'm talking the medium sized one, you know, you already have the platform, so no value there. So then it's going to be what's the purchase price? What sort of credits do you have? You're doubling down on old technology. I don't know. I mean, if, if uh, you know, if you're in one country, let's say I saw some of the Japanese companies, the leasing companies are merging, merging. you know. Uh, so you look at uh, some of the countries that have China, it's all state owned enterprise, right? Could you just sort of we already own this stuff, but it's hard to see A versus buying B. You know, because it's the, the, the numbers probably don't work unless unless people get real on the sell side. OK, Norm, thank you very, very much. Uh, Norm slides will be made available to the on the ISET website. Uh, and so will this session be uh, recorded. So recommend to your friends to look at this. I thought it was very, very interesting. And thank you so much, Norm, for that. OK, thank you. Goodbye, all. everybody.